thank you very much. Um, so I'm afraid I'm going to go much more macro than the previous speaker, mainly because I'm not a lawyer. Um, and so I thought it would be kind of good to start with a very, very macro view. This is the number of people using computers back since the 1980s. Um, and it's kind of worth just kind of getting a sense in the sort of the context of our regulatory discussion um, why we care so much more about this stuff than we used to care about it in the past. Um, which is when Netscape launched in 1994, there was something between 75 and 100 million PCs on Earth. Um, probably three quarters of those were in companies. So there were maybe 25 million consumer PCs on the entire planet. Um, even when Facebook launched, we were probably less than a billion internet users. There's now probably somewhere between four and a half um, and five billion people um, on Earth with a smartphone. Um, there's about five and a half billion adults, so we basically connected everybody. Um, and if you think about that kind of conceptually, we've gone through this sort of succession of generations in the tech industry um, where um, we were kind of working out, well, what's a computer, and what's a computer company, and what's a software company? And so in this period, um, in the mainframe era in the 60s and 70s, I think we peaked at something like 75,000 mainframes on Earth. And that's obviously kind of a slightly fuzzy question of wh what is a mainframe exactly. And in that period, of course, um, the industry was dominated by IBM. And people talked about IBM and the Seven Dwarfs, because there were seven other mainframe companies, and they were all tiny. Um, and IBM dominated the tech industry. And then the whole kind of model changed, um, and the PC became the center of the tech industry. Industry, and that, as we all know, was dominated by Microsoft and Intel. And the funny thing is, um, and I don't have a chart of this, but I did make a chart, um, is that IBM's mainframe business didn't go away. In fact, IBM's mainframe install base, measured in installed computing capacity, has risen every year since, 19, since the 1960s. Um, and they shipped at an all-time record mainframe capacity in the year 2020. Um, so business is still there. It just became completely irrelevant. Um, the same thing to the broader technology industry. So there is that kind of question of, well, what market is it exactly that you're dominant of? Are you dominant of the market for that product, or is that dominance of a broader industry? Um, the same thing then, of course, happened to Microsoft and Intel. Um, Microsoft dominated the, that model dominated the industry for sort of 15 years. Um, and then the center of gravity shifted to the web, and Microsoft remained a big company. Intel remained a big company. But you know, nobody started a company to make Windows software since about 2001, 2002. Um, Microsoft remains a big company, but no one's scared of them anymore in the broader industry. Um, and then we had sort of 15 years of the web. Um, and then we had smartphones, which sort of started in sort of 2007 to 2010, depending on how you count it. And smartphones have been the dominant paradigm in the tech industry for the last sort of 10 or 15 years. Um, now we've got to everybody. Um, and we sort of did a lot of the conversation in the tech industry is, well, what happens next? And as I could probably spend half an hour talking about that, and it basically boils down to either VR or crypto or both. Um, plus machine learning and everything. But meanwhile, the other side of the conversation is, well, what happens now that everybody has one of these things? Um, and to which the answer is really that this becomes a sort of systemically important part of society. Um, my best illustration of this is, is a study that Stanford did in 2017, where they found that 40% of all new relationships in the USA that year started online. So 40% of all new relationships began on a, in an online dating app. Um, and so this stuff has sort of gone from being kind of interesting and exciting. And Clive Sinclair's got a funny beard. and you know. Maybe Maybe your children should have a job in this to being just a sort of a central part of, of, of our society. And that sets, I think, a lot of the other sort of regulatory and policy questions. Um, I thought it was sort of fascinating to see Elizabeth Warren saying, um, I should be sort of judicious here, sort of spectacularly ill-informed things about the Apple App Store. Interesting because it's really hard to imagine that being part of a presidential campaign in 2000. I don't think in 2000 people were talking about um, Microsoft's control of Windows and what they were doing to Netscape. That wasn't like a kind of a national political conversation. Whereas because this stuff has become so much more important and so much bigger, it does. Now, that also reflects, of course, this, I think, fantastic quote from 1996, which is how the tech industry was thinking about this then, which is basically all you regulators, you should just go away and leave us alone. Um, you have no sovereignty here. This was a very sort of ideological part of the internet back then. It's also interestingly um, come back again with people in crypto who tend to, to talk, talk like this a great deal. Um, of course, that didn't really work out too well. Um, we got to 2021 and discovered that we'd connected everybody, and this stuff had kind of become a bit important. Um, and I think that the way that I generally think about this is that software ate the world, and so therefore all of the world's problems get expressed in software. Um, and so we get a whole bunch of stuff that we worry about. Um, and so privacy, speech, hate speech, encryption, political advertising, um, AI bias, labor laws, all sorts of sort of social, different kinds of social problems kind of roll across our, our newspapers' front pages every day. Um, and meanwhile, we have some giant companies. I did this chart at the beginning of this year. Um, I can't be bothered to update it because like, the market seems to change like 
10% each day. Um, but we get some kind of unprecedentedly large companies. And I think if you go back to the 1990s, you know, Microsoft and Intel were big companies. They were probably in the top 10. But you didn't have the kind of dominance of the indices that you get today from giant company, from technology companies, which is fundamentally a reflection of the fact that technology has become so much bigger, and therefore the opportunity of stuff works has become so much bigger. Um, none of this is going to get any easier. Um, none of these people are real. These are all faces generated by a neural network. Um, so all sorts of regulatory questions are going to carry on and kind of cascade, get, getting more and more difficult, more and more complicated, more harder and harder to work out. Um, and so I think one way to look at this stuff is that you know, there is sort of, so to speak, general legislation. Um, like, you know, if I kill somebody in the room here, I won't get arrested by the think tank police. Um, I'll just get arrested by the police. Like, so everybody is subject to general law. Um, but then there are sort of industry-specific regulation for industries that are kind of complicated and important and where there's important stuff that might go wrong. So, you know, there's an awful lot of regulation of how oil companies work. Um, there's a lot of regulation of railways, industrial food, aircraft, cars, indeed databases. And now we sort of apply that to the internet. Um, the problem is that if you say we regulate cars, that's not actually true. Um, because there's sort of 15 or 20 or 30 different things within that. Um, and there are all sorts of interesting complexities in each of those. There, is, there are, for example, internet national agreements on how we regulate safety features in cars. Um, there are, but then we don't have international agreements on how drink driving works. And some of these are antitrust questions. Some of them probably aren't. So you can go to General Motors and tell them they need to make the cars safer and that they're bullying Delphi. Um, but you can't make them um, change the speed limit or stop teenage boys from getting drunk or driving too fast. And I think sometimes we are, in some senses, in the phrase, phase of sort of assuming that Mark Zuckerberg has a magic button to solve all of these problems, in the same way that you might have sort of gone to General Motors and said, you know, you need to build more public transport. And I think General Motors probably couldn't have done that. Um, and we sort of understand that. But we haven't got quite got to that stage of understanding, well, what are all the different questions and what the trade-offs might be. Um, one of many of the conversations I have with regulators, incidentally, are a sort of an equivalent of saying, well, which regulator should be solving that? Is payday lending with a smartphone app a technology question or a social media question, or is that a financial services question? Um, it's kind of a, a kind, of, kind of conflict point that I'll come back to in a minute. Um, but just to kind of re re reinforce this point, um, this is, these are three pictures of Amsterdam sort of at 50-year intervals. This was, not, and this was clearly a problem caused by cars, but this was not an antitrust question. It wasn't even really a regulation question. This was an urban planning question. And so I think we're wrestling with what are all those problems? Who would be solving them? What would the trade-offs involved in solving them look like? Um, we also, of course, frankly, have some moral panics. Um, I think the clearest example of moral panic is this whole conversation around Amazon doing private label products, which basically tells me that the speaker has never been into a supermarket um, and has never heard of Sears, Roebuck, or Walmart. Um, because if you actually go and look at the retail industry, you discover that sort of 20 or 30 percent of most big retailers is private label. Um, Amazon is apparently between 1.5 and, and 2 percent private label. Um, it's very difficult to understand whether this is outrage that you've discovered something terrible in retail or outrage because this is just a new industry and you didn't, haven't really understood it. Um, a slightly more interesting conversation, I think, um, and I think sort of the earlier speaker sort of reference, uh, references, is this question of startup creation. Um, there was a kind of a really interesting statement in the US anti House Antitrust Report, the sort of 450-page report that was produced last autumn, that made sort of several times more or less made it a more or less direct assertion um, startup creation has dramatically decreased in the last decade. Um, now, I don't think if you got, I think if you got 10 people in the tech industry together, they wouldn't agree about anything except that that is completely, un completely unfounded. Um, this is data from the NBCA in the US. You can kind of slice this up various ways. But I, the one thing nobody would dispute is that we are in the hottest market for startup creation in the history of the technology industry. Um, there are huge numbers of companies being created all the time. Um, a slightly more interesting comment, I think, is this killer acquisition thesis. And I think there's a lot of kind of interesting nuance in this. As, so I'm sure many of you may know um, the FTC did a data collection exercise. They wrote to Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon, and Microsoft and said, OK, tell us everything you bought, um, and produced sort of a 30-page report um, this summer. And so that gets you to you know, 616 acquisitions in 2010 to 2019, of which you know relatively small proportion were even reviewed. Uh, which is kind of the headline that we've had. All these acquisitions, and no one looked at them, and this is clearly a regulatory failure. I think it's more interesting to actually ask, well, who, what were those acquisitions? And you discover that the vast majority of these were what we call acquihires. That's to say, it's a company of 5, 10, 15 people um, that had been around five years and hadn't worked. 
and it got bought by Amazon and tucked in somewhere inside the company. The product disappeared and they were basically hiring the engineers or they were acquiring a little piece of technology that would disappear somewhere inside that product. And more fundamentally, the thing they were building was never actually a competitor to Amazon. It might have been something that they wanted Amazon, where they wanted Amazon to buy the product. But they, were never they weren't actually trying to become Amazon or become AWS or become Instagram. They were making some little piece of plumbing that was sort of buried somewhere inside the company. Um, meanwhile, um, the other side of this is, you know, VCs don't want to invest in companies. They just want to sell stuff to Amazon or sell stuff to Google. If you kind of put those, those acquisitions in, in kind of context, um, I think the kind of the, just to kind of explain the pricing cutoff here, if something gets bought for 20 or 30 million dollars, the investors lost money. Almost certainly. Um, and even if they made you know, 1x or 2x return on their money, the, the venture model is that you, you want to make 10x on your deals because that half of the deals lose money. And so if something doesn't make 10x, that was basically a waste of your time. Um, and so on that basis, you should probably say any venture deal that sold for less than $50 million was a fail and failure, and probably quite a lot of the ones that sold for more than $50 million were a failure. And so if we take that $50 million cutoff, that gives us 132 acquisitions by these five companies in that period. In that period, um, there are 1,900 exits by U.S. venture companies, um, for rather for U.S. venture back startups, um, and 11, over 11,000 exits in total. And so it's kind of there's a lot of nuance in looking at these numbers because you know the, this is actually a very small portion of the U.S. startup scene. These, these companies are a very small portion the U.S. startup scene, and most of these are five people selling a small piece of technology um, as opposed to some sort of existential threat to the company. Now, the counter to this is this number less than 10 people. Instagram had seven people when Facebook bought it. Um, and so what do we think about the Instagram problem? Well, I, I would have tried to play video, but that would have been difficult. But this is a clip from The Daily Show. And John Stewart is, is talking about Facebook buying Instagram. And the phrase he uses, a billion dollars of money. <laughs> they paid money for this thing that ruins your pictures. And that was a very common reaction at the time. Um, now, famously, um, I think it was a CMA that analyzed this and said, well, Instagram doesn't have any ads, so they're not a competitor. And that was obviously a spectacularly short-sighted way of, of looking at what was going on. But it's actually very difficult at the time to work out, well, what is this thing and what's it going to become? I think another really interesting kind of pair to make here is that in the space of about nine months, Apple bought two companies. One of them was a company called Quattro Wireless. Um, which was a mobile ad network. And they spent, I think, three or four hundred million dollars for it. Um, they shut it down three or four or five years later, having completely failed to make a mobile ad network work. And ads, ads inside apps, they completely failed to make that work for a whole bunch of reasons. Basically, they just didn't have the culture or the right incentives. At roughly the same time, um, they also bought a company called PA Semi. Um, and this was what's called a fabulous semi company, so it's a chip design company. And PA Semi is the foundation of the fact that Apple is now making its own chips in its smartphones and Macs that have two or three times better performance than anything that Intel or Qualcomm can produce. Um, and so that competitive question, well, should they have been allowed to make that acquisition? What was that acquisition? How would you have worked that out in advance? Um, Shifting gear a little bit, um, this is an article by Matthias Stopfner, um, the CEO of Axel Springer. Um, companies should not have private data. We should take it away from tech monopolies. Um, I have a bunch of questions about this. One of my questions about this is, if a company can't have my data, how does my bank know how much money I have? This seems like a slightly absolutist and rather religious statement. Um, <laughs> another question, like, how does Amazon send me a parcel if they don't know my address? Like, how does that work? What does this mean? Um, a more important question, though, is that this article appeared on a website called Business Insider, which Axel Springer owns. Axel Springer's website that says it shouldn't have, you shouldn't, they shouldn't have your private data has 61 trackers <laughs> tracking your private data. So again, this might be a little bit more complicated. Um, now, 
I don't think anybody defends or likes the cookie model. This is a, a, a study that PwC did last year where they tried to track where the money had gone between the advertiser and the publisher, and they couldn't even work out where 15% of it had gone. They just couldn't find it. Um, <laughs> there's a little bit of argument about like maybe they screwed up the analysis, but you know the cookie model is going away. Um, regulators, on the one hand, platform owners are getting rid of cookies, and this is a whole sort of privacy argument. Um, it also means you're kind of breaking the online ad business, um, and it becomes much more difficult to do online advertising. We don't really have any idea what we're going to do about this, but then you have regulators arguing, because as, as I'm sure like everyone in the room will know, um, the ICO and the CMA have decided to get in a room and work out what they think about this, because from a privacy point of view, this is fantastic, and from a competition point of view, this is terrible, because suddenly you've given complete control of the online ad industry to Google and Apple, um, which is great for privacy, probably, but it's not actually very good for competition, because now those two companies basically control the entire structure of the online ad business. Um, this, of course, is the consequence of um, what happens if you start trying to regulate cookies, um, which is you pass a law that says you have to tell people what you're doing with your data, and you say, OK, we'll tell people what we're doing with your data. And it turns out that that's not actually a great kind of model for intervention. Um, meanwhile, um, as we kind of reconfigure um, all of these kind of privacy conversations, if we say you're not allowed to track me, you're not allowed to pass my data around, you're not allowed to analyze my behavior, well, that's not really a problem if you've got lots of users on your site all the time, because that doesn't affect you. you know, Google can still do this, Facebook can still do it, Amazon can still say, well, you bought this, this, and this, so we'll suggest that. Um, meanwhile, big publishers, where you spend you know, 20 minutes looking at 50 stories every day, also do that. So the New York Times can say, well, you read 50 travel articles in the last month, so we'll show you some travel ads. The trouble is the New Yorker can't. So the New York Times knows that you read 50 travel articles on the New York Times this week, um, but they're not allowed to tell the New Yorker over an ad network, and so the New Yorker can't show that ad. So we have all sorts of kind of questions around, well, we've had this kind of privacy guillotine, or might have a privacy guillotine. What does that do to competition at the platform level, at the publisher level, in the advertising level? How do we kind of reconcile those questions? Um, and one more example of this, this is what happens now in iOS 15. Um, if you open um, the Apple App Store, um, this is a reference to an old joke in Yes Minister, which is, um, you know, I give confidential briefings, um, you leak, and he is being prosecuted under Section 2B of the Official Secrets Act. <laughs> um, and so we, here we have, well, Apple doesn't track you, it just analyzes all of and records all of your behavior and shows you personalized ads, which is somehow not tracking you. And so this is um, the um, head of Instagram saying, I would be entirely happy if Apple let me use the same language that Apple uses to describe its own products and the things that Apple uses. Apple does not allow Instagram to say personalized advertising. Apple requires Instagram to say, we track you. Um, interesting trade-offs and interesting uses of platform power here. And so if I kind of, kind of generalize this question, um, supposing I want to say, well, we should regulate Instagram, what is it that that would do? Supposing I want to compete with Instagram, well, what do I need? I need, I don't really need your pictures. I need your friends. I need what pictures you've liked. I need who else liked those pictures. I need what other pictures those people liked. Who else liked those pictures? What other pictures those people posted in a kind of a concentric circle of data, none of which is my data. It's not even those other people's data as well. At a very simple level, if I like your picture, is that your data or my picture? And so the competition regulator says, well, yeah, we should let you export all of that information. And the privacy regulator says, even Instagram shouldn't have that information. This is a kind of a fundamental kind of conflict um, as to how this stuff would work. Generalizing this, this, this even further, um, this is an ad from the mid-'80s for a product that allows you to print your spreadsheets in landscape. Um, this is literally the only thing this product does. Um, it allows you to print your spreadsheets in landscape. It's $70 in 19, mid-1980s money, so that's, I think, like $150 or $200 or something today. Um, that's um, this button here. Yeah. <laughs> um, this, incidentally, is a famous lawsuit from 1967 um, around Ford integrating radios into cars and making it more difficult to sell competing radios, um, which I think mirrors the story exactly. Um, should Apple be allowed to do landscape 
in printing, yes or no? Should Microsoft be allowed to include a web browser in Windows? Ah, oh, well, 20 years ago, the answer was obviously no fucking way. <laughs> Today, if you said you buy a smartphone and it doesn't have a web browser on it, then people would say, well, what the fuck is this? Because um, that's why I bought it. <laughs> and so this is sort of the, the challenge. Um, if you're working for a technology company, is you sort of think, well, what is it that I'm supposed to be building here, and how would I go about doing that? Um, and I think there's a sort of a kind of a generalized policy challenge here, and you kind of have you can pick two of these. So you can make the product better in ways that you think makes it better. If you work at the company, you can integrate it, you can add features, you can make it easier to use. Um, that probably conflict makes life harder for people who are trying to sell those features themselves. But if you make it easier for the people who are trying to sell those features themselves, then you've probably broken or made some kind of trade-off around privacy and security. Um, and we tend to get these conversations from people at the EU who say things like, sort of, ha, 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 well, you'll just have to solve that. <laughs> and if you're building the product, you say, well, I can give you an export all my data button or not. But I can't do both of those. You're kind of going to need to choose which one of these things you want me to do. All of that gets me to my final slide, um, which is an analysis of, um, again, something that I hope nobody in this room needs to be told. Regulation tends to be good for incumbents, um, because the more complicated questions you ask and the more compliance people you need, um, the more not only do you create compliance costs, but the more that you tend to bake in existing market structures. Um, just one, one sort of final observation. Um, I started out by sort of observing that um, yeah, IBM's dominance was replaced by Microsoft's dominance, which was replaced by the web. Um, one of the most interesting companies I look at today is a company called Shopify, um, which makes a platform to make it easy to do an online store. Last year, Shopify did $120 billion of GMV, so gross merchandise value. So, about so merchants using Shopify sold $120 billion of product. That's about 40% of the size of Amazon Marketplace. Um, so if you're all um, Andy Jassy at Amazon, this is on your top five list of what do we do about this. But you can't go to Shopify and buy anything. And so if you're doing any kind of a market definition or trying to say, well, who does this compete with or what is Amazon's market, that wouldn't be in your market definition or it would be in a very unconventional kind of market definition. Um, Microsoft didn't make mainframes. Google didn't make a PC operating system. Um, Apple didn't do a search engine. And so the challenge in all of these kind of technology conversations is the competition is generally something that doesn't fit in any sort of conventional analysis of what the market is. It's probably changing what that market is or changing how you'd understand it. Um, so with that, I think um, that's it. I think there's a nice one. We've got time just to squeeze in a couple of questions. Sure. If anyone would like to ask uh, Mike at the back, have we got? Are we doing? Are we doing Roving Mike or just? No, I'll repeat the question. All right. Okay. Um, so uh, interesting talk. Thank you. Um, we have seen one anomaly when it comes to uh, apps, uh, and that's TikTok. So what do you make of it? And uh, how have they managed to get away with so much in terms of tailoring your for you page, for instance, and that sort of material to, to bring everyone in? Many young people don't mind, it seems, to use TikTok or you know, sacrifice their privacy or whatever the arguments are. So what do you make of TikTok? Well, so TikTok, there's, there's several interesting things. So the question is, what do we make of TikTok and privacy? And there's, there's several interesting things here. One of them is, does TikTok compete with Instagram or YouTube? Yeah. Uh, is that a useful question? I would argue that it's actually much more about YouTube than it is with Instagram. Instagram has tried to integrate, has integrated a competitor called Reels, but it's actually a different thing. It's not your friends. It's something else. It actually looks more, much more like YouTube, and you could. You know, if you were to try and work out, well, what is this, and who does it compete with? It's very easy to say Snapchat competes with Instagram. Much harder to work out what you think of, of TikTok. The second answer is there is this whole kind of privacy, w interesting kind of privacy narrative that says if it's happening inside a company, that's private. But if it's happening between several companies, that's not private. And that seems to be sort of, I don't know what the kind of the correct term in rhetoric for this would be, but this is sort of trying to win an argument by defining your terms rather than actually debating the question. You know, it's a classic thing, are you pro-life or pro-choice? Well, both, so you haven't really answered the question. Um, and so, I mean, the best example of this problem, I thought, was Apple's, um, Apple's blow-up with CSAM scanning. So Apple says, we want to scan for child sexual abuse material, 
but we don't want to do it in the cloud because we think that's not private, so we'll do it on the device, and that will be private. Because Apple has built this whole narrative that if they're doing the analysis on the device and Apple Incorporated doesn't have the data, only your phone has the data, that's private. And so they put, create this technology where your phone will scan the pictures as you upload them to iCloud, not anything else. And they were absolutely certain that was private. And they had this huge backlash of, maybe that's not private. And I think this is something that kind of rolls through, which the reason I spent some time talking about privacy, is we don't really have like a settled understanding of what do we mean when we say that would be private or not private. So to your question on TikTok, well, TikTok is only analyzing stuff inside TikTok. So on Apple's analysis, it's completely private. Um, is it? I don't, well, it depends. What do you mean? Like, let's start by working out what we mean by private before we say, is that a problem? Table, go ahead. Yes, thank you very much for the, <coughs> for the presentation. This was fascinating. I do have a, a question. It might be hard to answer, but I'm asking for your best guess. Which percentage of the data that Facebook owns you would say could be relevant to let's say TikTok or one of the competitors because you know this brings the issue of data sharing and portability and I'm not sure if actually they could utilize the data coming from another company. So I, I have a thing on my list of things to write about which with the sort of working title data is data doesn't exist. Um, um, I, I, friend, I, I know slightly the CEO of, of, of Amazon and he said he was watching the BBC and he saw somebody say that we need to have a, re a register of all algorithms. <laughs> Okay, I have a spreadsheet that calculates my mortgage payment. So I need to tell the algorithm regulator? Because that's what that means. And it's kind of the same when people say data. Um, Tim O'Reilly had this great phrase, data isn't oil, data is sand. D data mostly is only valuable in the aggregate of millions or billions of little points of data. Um, no advertiser cares about you at all. They only want to know, do you have babies or not? so that they can show ads for nappies to people who have babies and not show them to people who don't have babies. You know, the vast majority of the sort of privacy conversation is, is sort of, is, that's sort of the problem with the privacy conversation because actually the advertisers don't care and Facebook kind of doesn't care either. It's just that's how the system works. So to your question, like, what data could you export? Well, it kind of depends what the data is and what would be relevant, and it depends whether it would come in any form that they could use in any meaningful sense. I mean, Facebook has all sorts of information about you, most of which has no value to anyone except infrastructure engineers inside Facebook, some of which is about, well, you are interested in the following 30 categories. That's probably like 1% of all the data that Facebook actually has. Um, most of it is like, how quickly does your page load on average when you open the app? You know, it's really kind of micro-engineering data which isn't valuable to anybody. But even that list of, like, okay, these are the 150 things that they think you're interested in, how would that map against TikTok? I don't know. I mean, I used TikTok for a while, and somehow I got into a rabbit hole where I mostly got Midwestern guys talking about fixing their trucks, because I thought this was kind of interesting. It's not a very sophisticated algorithm, you know. It's just like, you watch that, so we'll show you more of that. So if they got my Facebook data, would that be valuable to them? Well, maybe, but I think people, far too much people talk about this stuff as like, well, we'll give them the data. And that doesn't mean anything. Uh, can I sneak in one quick question of my own, actually? Sure. Um, you had one slide where you alluded to this so somewhat being driven by moral panic. I wonder if you think, is that a moral panic at grassroots level amongst ordinary people and users? of these platforms? Or do you think, this is a slightly leading question from me, is it more of an elite moral panic and, and perhaps tied into the idea that perhaps um, establishment um, legislators and regulators feel like they don't have enough power of this and over these things and they'd quite like more power over them? So I don't think I would say this is driven by moral panic. I think some of the concerns within it look like moral panic. Um, there's certainly sort of an aspect of, you know, Instagram is killing teenage girls and you think, well, we, how many other things have we said that about? Go back, like novels were going to make women infertile and bicycles <laughs> were certainly going to make women infertile. Um, 
and so you know there is I think one just has to sort of be conscious and say well wait a minute should I take this particular like, what is actually going on with this one secondly I think um, you know this stuff has just become structurally important to society and so that attracts a different level of political scrutiny to when it was you know when Bill Gates was on every magazine cover he basically sold com accounting tools to big companies so that attracted a different level of political priority to something that's used by basically everybody in the country and becomes a major form of media and social discourse and everything else and so it's sort of natural and entirely appropriate that that should get more political scrutiny I think there's a maybe a third answer is you're seeing one of the things that you see in the sort of regulatory push is sort of profoundly different cultural attitudes to what regulation is and how it should work and so, you know, to kind of characterize very crudely, you know, in America, a company has an absolute right to do almost anything as long as it isn't specifically in breach of a particular law. And but every now and then, they will shoot you to make an example for all the others, and everyone will go, oh, shit, we better not do that. Um, or they'll fine you a billion dollars, and everyone goes, wait, but everyone's been doing that. Um, whereas the EU approach is much more like just the fact that here's this big industry that doesn't have any regulation that's specific is a sort of failure. And it's a natural part of the role of the state to decide what business models are and how companies operate. And like we missed out, we failed because we haven't. We, we better catch up with this stuff. Um, and those are just sort of different cultural ideas about what the role of the regulation or the state is in the economy. And so I think that's kind of a, kind of another piece. Now there clearly there's a layer, there's a small layer on top, which you get, for example, in the sort of the UK idea that somehow we shouldn't allow anonymous accounts on social media, which is basically this is politicians' personal experience of using Twitter, as they have loads of anonymous accounts shouting at them and so that's their experience of what the problem is if you go to Facebook and they say well, well none of our accounts are anonymous and we have all the same problems um, and indeed Twitter did their analysis of taking off racist tweets after the football championship and they said none of those accounts are anonymous so sometimes it is a focus on an individual political or an individual elite concern or experience I think mostly it's much more as I sort of said right at the beginning of the presentation this has just become like a systemically important part of society and we're kind of like trying to work out what do we do about this just as like we regulate cars, or we regulate aircraft, or we regulate railways. Well, yes, we do. Well, that's, that's no natural. But we're trying to work out what, the, what that would mean. So I think we had one more question there. Or I don't know how we are for time. Um, what I was going to throw out, um, our, our Netflix, World of Warcraft, and, and um, Instagram in the same market competing with each other? Well, so this, this acronym FANG ones? drives me crazy because A, Netflix is like a tenth of the size of the other companies by market cap. B, it's not a platform. No one makes companies to write stuff, write software that runs on Netflix. I look at Netflix, and this is maybe a broader point, Netflix is a TV company. You know, Netflix is the new sky. Netflix is using a new technology that's a com commodity and available to everyone to build an entirely new subscription TV business just the way Sky did 20 or 30 years ago. Um, now they're doing it globally rather than in the UK, but all the questions that matter if you're actually trying to invest in te Netflix are TV questions. Like, what shows, how many shows, what genres, what's the right structure, what happens when now that Disney's goes direct, will Sony go, go direct, what do you pay the actors, what happens if you have contra... Like, all the questions are LA questions. They're not technology questions at all. Um, and this is, you know, this is sort of a... You know, it's my point that I made earlier, you know, if it, is a payday lender using an app a, top, a software company? Or sh maybe, should it be regulated by Ofcom or by the financial services regulator? Well, surely the financial, whoever it is that regulates payday lending should be regulating that. It's got nothing to do with Apple. Um, it's a payday lending company. And so I think you kind of have to, you know, that question applies very generally as you look at these kinds of, kinds of problems. Like, what kind of a problem is that? Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, if you enjoyed that conversation, why not watch one of these other videos? And while you're here, remember to hit the subscribe button and the notification bell. That way, you'll never miss out on a single IEA broadcast.